Hello and welcome to Good Old Radio Vintage Radio Shows. Kick back, grab a cup of coffee, some favorite tea, and let's start the show. Today's show is The Ford Theater Presents A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Sponsored by Good Music Radio, let's start the show. This is the Ford Theater, presenting the first in a new series of full-hour radio dramas under the sponsorship of the Ford Motor Company. May we introduce, as spokesman for the management of the Ford Theater, the distinguished playwright, actor, and producer, co-author of Life with Father and State of the Union, Mr. Howard Lindsay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Ford Theater, a new and hopeful structure located at the corner of this wavelength and Main Street, USA and Canada. Your seats, of course, are in the front row, on the beam. And you'll notice that the Ford Theater, like many an older playhouse, has a motto carved on the keystone of the arch that spans the stage. It reads... The play is the thing. This afternoon's play is based on a famous American novel which, as far as we can learn, has never before been presented on the air. We shall hear George Zachary's production of A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain. Mark Twain wrote The Connecticut Yankee just short of 60 years ago, and the Yankee he wrote about was a typical last-century American, a foreman of iron workers in a Hartford gun foundry. But suppose old Mark were alive and kicking, as usual, today, at this moment. How would he choose his hero here in the year of our Lord, 1947? And how would he begin his strange tale? Well, if I were Mark, I can imagine I might begin somewhat on this order. I came across the curious stranger of my story in the Hall of Armor at the Metropolitan Museum here in New York one fine Sunday afternoon early last summer. I was reading the descriptive placard set below a magnificent suit of armor in the center of the hall when I noticed a quiet, serious-looking young man beside me. Leaning forward a little, he read the inscription aloud and with marked contempt. Sixth century Hoburk, said to have belonged to Sir Sagramola Desirous, knight of King Arthur and member of the round table. Observe the bullet hole through the armor in the left breastplate. It cannot be accounted for. (laughs) That's what they think. I beg your pardon, sir. Which ye well, I saw it done. You saw it? Matter of fact, mister, I did it myself. It all started in Hartford, Connecticut, right in my own backyard. I was on terminal leave. I'd been with the Seabees in the Pacific for three years, and it turned out that the fellow next door had been with the Army engineers. He was boasting about them one day. I couldn't take that. I told him that the Army engineers couldn't even build a pontoon bridge unless they had prefabricated parts. I didn't expect he'd resent a simple statement of fact such as that, so I was wide open when his fist landed, and I went out like a light. When I woke up, I was lying on a dirt floor. Above me was a low stone ceiling, and around me were four stone walls, one with a heavy metal door, Before I even had time to be surprised, the door opened and a young guy came in. He was dressed from neck to knees in a pair of shrimp-colored tights, and he carried a crust of bread in one hand and an earthenware mug in the other. Fair sir, will you take sup? Will I which? Will you taste of bread and sip of water therewith to fill thy paunch and slake thy thirst? What, what, What kind of talk is that? Where am I? Marry, sir, where wouldst thou be other than in King Arthur's court? Where? King Arthur's court, have you no ears? Say, what kind of joke is this? 
Where for dost thou think it a joke? Listen, I'm talking to a guy in my own backyard. He knocks me out. I wake up in jail. You come in decked out in some kind of costume, spotting some kind of queer language. What word would you use for it except joke? Ah. And uh, dost consider it likewise a joke that thou art to be burned at the stake within the hour? Burned at the stake? What for? Thy strange dress doth proclaim thou art an evil magician. An evil magician? Look, kid, I want to see a lawyer. I know not what meaneth lawyer, and I height not, kid. And it please your worship, I height Pierre de Beauchamp and Bedivier de Boutelier. Pierre de Bush, Bush, Bush. I'll call you uh, Clarence. Uh, look, I'd better get the picture as you see it. You say this is King Arthur's court. Wit ye well, and so it be, the glorious Arthur, whose golden reign hath blessed us since the year 510. 510? And what year is it now? Why, 528. But what mattereth to thee what year it be, since it be thy last day on earth? <laughs> now... Wilt thou come with me in orderly fashion, or must I need summon the guards? I'll come quietly, officer. Anything to find out what this is all about. Thou hadst bets chill thine eyes. The glare of the sun is fearsome. Say, what are all those people doing over there in that field? No, sweet your worship, they are come to see thee burn. Holy mackerel, you weren't kidding. <laughs> Yonder is the stake. No, this can't be. This must be a nightmare. But I better not take any chances. Uh, uh, Clarence... What time is this bonfire set for? When the sun doth reach its highest point. Noon, huh? Noon, sun. Clarence, what's the date today? The 21st of June. The 21st of June, the year 528. But that's wonderful. Wonderful? Has taken leave of thy senses, my lord. Clarence, congratulate me. I will not be burned today. <laughs> I'd remembered something. Something from the days when I used to memorize the almanac to keep from going stir-crazy on those Pacific coral reefs. On that day, there was a total eclipse of the sun. Now, these people apparently believed in magic, and they'd certainly never heard of an eclipse. So I turned to Clarence. Sir? Is, um, is King Arthur in the house? Yonder he sits, under the royal canopy. Ah. Hey there, King Arthur! Speakest thou to me? To nobody else but... I hear you think I'm a magician. So Merlin hath informed me. Who's Merlin? Know ye not of Merlin? It is he who sitteth here upon my right hand. For he be my trusted advisor and the most powerful magician in all the land. And he wants to get rid of me. Afraid of the competition? Nay, he fears not thee nor any man. Is it not so, good Merlin? My gracious liege, I well know the limit of this man's power. He can do naught to harm us. Is that so? Is that so? Listen, King Arthur, if you go through with this barbecue, I'll cook up the worst disaster since Noah's flood. Uh, how say you? I will blot out the sun. Merlin, can he in truth do this thing? He can, Sir King, but he dare not, for it can be done only by calling upon that awful being whose name tis death to pronounce. That's ridiculous. Enough, enough, I believe thee, good Merlin. I am to the stake. Okay, if that's the way you want it. You hear that, all you people? Your king has doomed you to destruction. I am going to destroy the sun. Hark as I call forth the forces at my command. Reet, pleat. Zoot, zoot. Hey, bubba, rebop. Mercy dodes, bleep, bloop. Hudson Ross and other riller Upon you, O oh dreaded one, upon you whose name may not be spoken save by the chosen few, on you I call to destroy the sun as I pronounce thine awful and fearful name, Snafu! My timing was on the nose. The crowd went mad with fear. But I wasn't feeling so good either, because I figured to myself, there's no eclipse due on June 21st in 1947. This must be the year 528, and I am in King Arthur's court. Well, there was no help for it. I'd have to make out as best I could. 
Meanwhile, King Arthur was practically down on his knees pleading with me. Good, sweet, most powerful magician, bring not this disaster upon the world because of mine own disbelief in thee. Reflect, gracious sir, bring back the sun. Okay, King Arthur, here's my proposition. If I bring back the sun, you appoint me permanent prime minister. My cut will be 10% of any increase in revenue I produce for the state. If I can't live on that, I won't ask for a raise. Is it a deal? Away with his bond! <laughs> Rich and poor shall do him homage. He is the king's right hand and is clothed with full power and authority. Now, good sir, sweep away the night and bring the light again. Let the enchantment dissolve and pass harmless away. Open the door, Richard! They thought I was the greatest magician in the world. King Arthur wanted to fire Merlin without so much as two weeks' pay, but I vetoed that. That's where I made my first mistake. Then I realized what a man out of the 20th century could do back there in the 6th. Every little thing I did created a sensation. I showed them my watch. Oh, it is marvelous. Well, it's an infernal machine. It's amazing. I flashed my pocket lighter. Have a care. He yeah. holds a fire in his hand. It is a magical torch. Even my jokes panicked him. Uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> marvelous, sir, boss. Oh, a prodigy of you. <laughs> he slayeth me. <laughs> then, to top it off, I cooked up a batch of dynamite and... <laughs> Blew up Merlin's castle. That did it. So far as King Arthur's court was concerned, I was the boss. In fact, if you wanted to talk to me, you said Sir Boss and liked it. Sir Boss, in truth I am loath to disturb thee, but there is a maiden come from the king who waited these two months, craving audience with thee. <sighs> Send her in, Clarence. Okay, Sir Boss. Demoiselle Arison de Cattlewares. Sir Boss. Well, my girl, what can I do oh, for you? Oh, the chance, fair Sir Boss, thou canst succeed, wherein all others have failed. The dragons are of such a size to fright the soul of even the most valorous of men as they do glare from their terrible eye, which does sit witchy well in the very center of their forehead. Wait a minute. Like a day in you, what how many have I said, and yet Wait a minute. Ugly. Yet I hold them not blameless. Wait a minute! Clarence, what's she talking about? Um... King Arthur hath appointed thee her protector. Thou must slay for her, uh... Fearsome dragon. Dragon? I, my mistress, with 44 other maidens, I held captive in a castle surrounded by the most fearful oh, monsters. Oh, that... let's just. Clarence, you know I don't have time to play truth or consequences, even with a cutie like this. But, Sir Boss, she may not leave thy side until thou hast granted her boon, as the law of chivalry. Oh, rats. I tell you what, Clarence, give her my correspondence course on shorthand and typing. If she insists on hanging around, she might as well be useful. <laughs> Come thou with me, Arizan. Fare thee well, sweet your worship. See you later, uh, uh, Sandy. Clarence, the more I see of this chivalry business, the more convinced I get that it's just a phony racket. Don't these knights have anything better to do than go around bashing in each other's skulls in tournaments and, 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 and chasing dragons that don't exist? Why, for sooth, Sir Boss, is all they know. Why can't they do something more productive, do something for their people? Um, what meaneth thou by people? You know, folks other than knights. Oh, forsooth, there be none worth mentioning other than the knights. These others exist only in that they may serve the knights. What sort of wages do they get? Wages? What signifieth wages? Never mind, that answers the question. Are they at least treated kindly? Good, Sir Voss. The knights know not the meaning of kindness. Marry the life of these ye call the, the people. They do esteem as something less than the life of a good dog or a, a middling horse. Clarence? I think I'll have to make some changes in that direction. Would you like to help? That I would, although I be high-born. Yet I relish not the time when I am knighted and needs must go about breaking the bones of innocence so that I may be termed valorous. I would rather be as thou, Sir Boss, a uh, uh, hep character. That's the spirit, Clarence. Now, I want you to find about 50 other boys your own age who feel the way you do. I'll put them through a grind that'll make the CB training course look like a vacation. But one thing, Clarence, Merlin is my sworn enemy. If he spills a word of this to Arthur and the Knights before we're ready for them, our hash is cooked. The whole operation is top secret. You 
Got that letter ready for my signature, Sandy? Tis ready for thy new fountain pen, sir boss. Yes, Clarence. Ho. Oh. To visit you, His Majesty Arthur, King of the Table Round, Sir Mordred de Rougemont, half-brother to the King, the court magician murdered... Send him in. Sir Boss, Alessandra Cathedral. Your Majesty. Sir Boss, we have come to this tower thou callest penthouse, and unto this room thou callest office, to learn for what reason thou dost defy our royal will. How's that, King? It's half a year since His Majesty had bidden thee to slay the dragon for the maiden Alessandre. Oh, so that's it. Go on with your work, Sandy. Wherefore dost thou remain in the confines of thy battlements, Sir Boss? Art thou faint of heart? Faint of heart, my eye. Listen, Mordred, I've got better things to do than chase around in a tin suit. Aye? What, sir, boss? What more important? None of your business, you old faker. Your Majesty, until this day have I waited to present thee proof of yon traitor's acts. In the dark of night doth he brew his black magic on land and on water, on shores and in the woods and the barrels of the earth, and even in the air itself hath he confederates working and plotting to destroy thee. And thy crown. That's a lie, Merlin. Canst deny thine own works? Gaze, O Arthur, upon the maid at table, pecking with her fingers as a hen pecketh corn. Tis only a typewriter, Your Majesty. Ah, tis black magic meant to destroy thee. Listen, you witch doctor without a mask. I'm not trying to destroy your king. I'm trying to put his reign 1,400 years ahead of its time. Destroy him. Why, when I'm finished, Arthur will be able to change the entire course of history. Thou speakest fair, Sir Boss. Me wear a silken tongue, O oh my king. Listen, Arthur, I'll put my cards on the table right now. I like you. I'm doing everything I can to help you. But if helping you means that I have to destroy the rotten, unjust, antiquated structure of chivalry, then that's just what I'll do. He slandereth chivalry, my lord. What? Nay, he meaneth not, Mordred. The heck I don't. Wilt thou defame all knighthood? Now goes too far, Sir Boss. Defend thee, Violet. Why, you dumb clock? Hold, hold, Boss. Hold, Mordred. Nay, I am of two minds about this matter. In this manner shall we settle it. Upon the morrow do you, Sir Boss, appear upon the field of honor to do battle with Sir Mordred. If thou dost vanquish him, then so thy work shall continue. Yet, if thou art vanquished, then will all thy powers be forfeit and thyself be banished from the land. Fine. Sir Boss, thou art not afraid. Afraid of this sardine can, Sandy? Listen, King Arthur, Mordred isn't enough. I'll take on your whole round table. Sir Boss! From Lancelot to Sagramore Le Desirous, we'll settle this thing once and for all. <laughs> I spent the night trying to figure an angle to beat the collected assortment of the Knights of the Round Table. Everything I believed in depended on it. It was the final test of the 20th century against the 6th. I knew, of course, that Merlin was busy all night, too, saying incantations and weaving spells around his boys. That was the trouble with Merlin. He believed his own magic. Came the dawn, and I dressed up in the fanciest pair of tights I could find in Clarence's clothes closet, and off I went to the tournament grounds. To see that crowd, you think it was a World Series. There wasn't a vacant seat in the house, and everyone there was yelling for my blood. I walked to the middle of the field, bowed to the king and queen, and stood there waiting. All of a sudden, the trumpet started a racket. And a herald called out, Sir Lancelot, into the fray for king and country! Well, they were sending in their powerhouse right off. The gates at the end of the arena flew open, and a suit of armor perched on a horse bore down on me. I waited until he had worked up full steam, then I whipped out a lasso I had hidden under my cape, whirled it around a few times like I used to when I was a kid, and let go. It went round his shoulders, and I pulled tight for all I was worth. He bit the dust. He couldn't get to his feet, being encased in a ton of metal. King and country! I yanked back my lasso, recoiled it, and by that time, Sir Gareth was in position for my attack. I tossed the lasso. Sir Gareth bit the dust. 
That sort of thing went on for almost an hour. The ground was covered with wriggling suits of armor, and my right arm was getting ready to drop off when the herald called out, So Sagamore and desirous into the brave for king and country! Suddenly, I noticed Merlin beside me. He hissed in my ear. Now, sir, boss, have I spun around Sir Sagamore's spell, which protects him well from thee. Says you. And now art thou helpless for all thy magic weapons. Look, go paddle your foolishness somewhere else. Scatch, all right. <laughs> He scattered, and I reached on to pick up my lasso. It was gone. The old humbug had swiped it. Sir Sagramore charged at me, a ton of man and horse and steel, straight down upon me. The crowd went wild. It looked as if I was a goner. I had no choice. I reached into my pocket and brought out my last trick, the one I'd hoped I'd never have to use. I used it. Well, sir, that's it. That's how the bullet hole got into Sagamore's breastplate here in the museum. Like I said, I put it there myself. And so you vanquished all the knights of the round table. Yep, but that was only the beginning. Would you, would you like to hear the rest? I certainly would. Well, then, give me a minute to get it all straight in my head. You see, sometimes I can't tell one century from another. While the Yankee pulls himself together, we'll remain right here in the 20th century. We have with us in the Ford Theater this afternoon a gentleman whose family name is recognized everywhere in the world as a symbol of 20th century progress. Progress in human relations as well as in mechanical techniques. We are honored to present the president of the Ford Motor Company, Mr. Henry Ford II. Mr. Ford. Good afternoon. On behalf of all of us at the Ford Motor Company, I want to welcome you as our guests on this, the first broadcast of a new Ford radio program. We are very happy indeed to have you in our listening audience. At this hour, every Sunday afternoon, we plan to bring you the finest radio plays drawn from every field, stage, screen, books, and radio. To make sure that each production is the best possible, we have called on a group of able and experienced radio men and women, writers, actors, directors, and musicians. They have been at work for months, preparing the first series of plays. Their work has had one major objective, to bring you stories that people have liked and that we hope you will like. As we at the Ford Motor Company continue to do our best to serve you, we want to merit your confidence, not only in the kind of cars and trucks and tractors we make for you, but also through our actions and services in the thousands of towns and cities all over the country where we meet you and do business with you, and in what we do as an industrial citizen in this great land of freedom and opportunity. And if we are to continue to deserve your confidence, we think you must know and understand what we are doing and what we are trying to do. We hope then that you will be a regular member of our Sunday listening audience. We hope that you will like our program. We hope also that you will be interested in some of the things we may want to tell you from time to time about ourselves and our products. Only by getting acquainted with each other can we hope to serve you better, with better cars and trucks that more and more of you can afford to buy. Thank you, Mr. Ford. In just a moment, Howard Lindsay and Act Two of A Connecticut Yankee. We now pause for station identification. The Ford Theater, a Connecticut Yankee, Act Two. Scene, the Hall of Armor at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Our friend, the CB from Hartford, takes up his curious story once more. The tournament between the knights and me had more to it than met the eye. 
So far as Arthur was concerned, it was the final test of magical strength. But I knew it was also a struggle between the existing forces of tyranny and oppression, namely Merlin and the Knights, and the struggling forces of freedom and equality, namely me. Merlin knew that as well as I did, and we both knew, too, that the battle wasn't over yet. For the next five years, I worked night and day with Clarence and our picked crew. We tapped for oil, we mined for coal and ore. We set up refineries and steel processing and manufacturing plants of all sorts. And we didn't neglect the ammunition. At last, I was ready. Wherefore bringest thou me into these cavernous buildings, Sir Boss? King Arthur, I've shown you folks a lot of magic since I've been here, but today you're going to see a form of magic that tops everything. Black magic? Or white magic, Sir Boss? Scientific magic, Merlin. See here. Sir Boss, what is this? This is an automobile assembly line. What signifieth automobile? That's one right there. It's like unto the chariot of the Prince of Darkness. It's a chariot, all right. It moves at many times the speed of a horse. Faster than my horse? Much faster. Of course, this is only a Model T. In another ten years, we'll be able to make a Lincoln. Now, if you'll step into this next room. Nay, it is black as night, Sir Boss. Merlin, bring light. You won't need a torch, King Arthur. Just push this little button. So. Ah. Wondrous light. It is brighter than the sun. That is but one of the powers of electricity, King Arthur. Ah, it is an old enchantment. Oh, it has other uses. Uh, here, Merlin, pick up this wire. There's some mischief, I trow. Walter not, Merlin, seize it. <laughs> Sir Boss. Thou hast slain him. No, nah, he's just knocked out. Could have happened to anybody who was changing a fuse. What is in this box, Sir Boss? Reach out and turn the knob, King Arthur. Have no fear. Turn the knob. Yes. <clears throat> Camelot armor never gets hot. It's air conditioned in every spot. It never rusts. The chimes like you. Camelot is the armor for you. C A M E L O T. No, no, no. Call the chimes, Sir Boss. Nate is enough. You don't care for the radio? Uh, methinks tis a mixed blessing. Sir Boss, I have seen most marvelous things this day. Truly, thou art the greatest magician the world has ever seen. King, you ain't seen nothing yet. Look up at the sky. Ah, oh, a huge bird. Nope, an airplane. Watch. How would you like to ride in that, King Arthur? Ah, methinks to be a great adventure. Hast thou not taught me this day there is no danger in these things? Well, it takes a little time to learn to manage them. Then I will take the time to learn. And all my people shall learn. And then will each night ride upon an automobile. And every castle shall have light and heat and a radio. And each night an electric razor. You mean you want to hand all this over to the knights? Forsooth to my people. But, King Arthur, the knights are not your people. How then? The men and women who work in the fields, who repair the roads, who, who weave the clothes you wear, these are your people. But they're not ready for my miracles. Not ready? Your people are ignorant. They're poor. They're miserable. Most of them a little better than slaves. If I turn these things loose among them, they'll destroy themselves. My magic can be a blessing only if it's used with intelligence, by free men. I mean to give it to your people when you have made them free. Sir Boss, I understand thee not. What meaneth freedom? Look, King Arthur, you've never really been among your wretched people. Come with Sandy and me for a week or two, disguised as a peasant. See for yourself what their lives are really like. You mean they would know me not? Ah, it would be a bold adventure. I'll do it. King Arthur, Sandy, some noblemen are coming up the road. What matters it? Let them come. Get to the side of the road or they'll ride you down. Ride me down? You're a peasant now, my liege. Aye, aye, I had forgot. Um, hasty fair, Sandy. Stand we aside. And put on a humble attitude. They'll be around the curve in a moment. Duck your head. Keep your eye on the ground. Oh, is this all right? Oh, it'll have to do. Here they come. Don't move an inch till they pass. Hold there, Harley. Ah? Oh. 
Venest thou me? Verily, I mean thee. How many leagues toward lies the next village? Upon my soul, I know not. You know not? Wherefore know you not what I ask thee? Thou art insolent. Mayhap this will serve to teach oh, no. Sandy, stay where you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Forward! Sandy, are you all right? It is nothing, fair Sir Boss. Good Sandy. It grieves me sore that thou shouldst bear the last stroke meant for me. It was not meet that thou shouldst suffer. Thou art the king. Yet am I a man too and would not have a woman. My liege, thou... the trouble is that while you look like a peasant, you don't act like one. And wherein am I lacking? In the first place, you stand too straight. Slouch over. Uh, thus? More. <clears throat> when a man is poverty stricken, when he's miserable and oppressed, the manhood in him is sapped out. He's left with shoulders that droop, a slouching body, a shuffling walk, and a head that hangs low. There's no spirit left in him. He has doubt in his heart and fear in his soul. Can you understand that? I can, as well as any man. Then concentrate on it until terror and despair have become as much a part of you as the beating of your heart. Learn what it feels like to be a man without a birthright. <laughs> Arthur had much to learn, and in the next week or so, plenty of opportunity for schooling. Here we saw a young girl accused of witchcraft burned alive. There a man tortured to death for refusing to confess to cutting down a tree on his master's estate. Another was drawn and quartered for trapping a rabbit to feed his starving family. This was the lot of the common man in the age of chivalry. No one challenged us along the way, and we went unrecognized, but not unobserved. How long, wise Merlin, have they been gone from Camelot? Ten days, Sir Mordred. Uh-huh. Thou understandeth full well thy part in this action? It is simple enough. Arthur, Sir Boss, and the maiden are this night nigh unto London town, and will within the week be in the place itself. Thou wilt hasten there and follow the plan. <laughs> so Arthur hath desires to be amid his people, hath he? We will arrange it so that he shall have his wish. And we will have the throne. Mordred, thou hast spoken naught of this to the queen? To no one. Were death to do so, for she would speak of it to Lancelot. For Lancelot loveth the king like a brother. He and those affection for the queen taketh the direction other than sister. <laughs> now it groweth late. I thee to London, fair Mordred. Thou shalt yet be... King. Well, I wasn't a magician, so I didn't know what was in store. But I was just as worried about that Lancelot Guinevere team as Merlin was, only for a different reason. I couldn't figure it. So one day, when Arthur had gone to forage for food, I asked Sandy about it. Faith, Sir Boss, this is not difficult to explain. Arthur hath a great soul and mind which doth try to understand the world about him. Therefore, can Guinevere not possess him entirely? And it is this she doth resent, even though she be not aware of it. So she turns to Launcelot, who's nothing but a big, good-natured clown. Oh, thou must not censure her for it. All women are likewise. You too? Mayhap I will be too, if e'er I marry. <laughs> Sandy, you're not the silly girl I took you for at first. You said a mouthful, Sir Boss. What was that? Oh, tis a phrase Clarence taught me. A fair-sounding phrase, is it not? I am quick to learn. Uh-huh. But do you think Arthur's learning anything from this self-conducted pole? He hath seen enough of misery, my lord, to make him wonder that men can bear their burden. He hath learned to love his people, not from kingly heights, but from his heart. That's what I'm trying to get at, Sandy. If we can make him forget about the divine right of kings and convince him of the inherent rights of men, nothing will stop us. Sir Boss... Thou art truly noble in thyself. <laughs> and handsome, too. Uh, Nick, Sandy, come on, let's find Arthur. I want to get to London before dark. London at that time was no more than a sprawling mud village. The filth and litter that clogged the streets was incredible. And the people, thousands of them, swarming, sweating, and swearing in every nook and corner. For a while, the three of us wandered around the shops, and when Sandy spotted a hat shop she liked, we left her there. I wanted to get Arthur back to the marketplace where he could get an on-the-spot view of some slaves being sold. 
That was part of his education. So back to the marketplace, the two of us went. We got a place near the auction block, and it wasn't too comfortable. We were pushed and jostled. And then suddenly, the king and I were seized and thrust toward the block. The men who had done it stood grinning before us. Arthur was livid. He roared out. What meaneth this in manner, jest? <laughs> jest, he calls it. What maketh ye think tis a jest? Put these slaves to the block for sale. Slaves? I'm no we're not slave. We're slaves. We're farmers. We're free men. If indeed ye be free men, bring forth your proofs. What proofs? The law requireth you to prove ye are free men, and ye cannot. You're a slave. Thou art mad. No, he's not. It's the law that's mad. We're stuck, Arthur. Nay, mark ye yonder rise, Mordred. Mordred! Mark ye, Mordred, fair brother. Who calleth? Over here. It's I who call. What insolence is this? But a slave to dare call out to me. Mary, I am no slave with thy brother. I am Arthur. Arthur? A slave, my brother? The man's mad. Give him twenty lashes. Upon his back. That he may regain his senses and learn in what fashion he is, my brother. Yeah. Mordred! Mordred! Ah, uh, he knew me not. Prepare thyself, Violet. <laughs> How darest thou? I'll teach thee to lay thy low-born hands upon my person. Arthur, no! I... Arthur, oh, no! Arthur. Hey, Arthur, what did you do to this guy? Great catfishes, you killed him. Tis as he deserved. Brother, this does it. Now we're really up the creek. <laughs> Arthur in a dungeon, a slave. I shall not suffer it. I shall proclaim myself. You open your mouth and we'll really be in a mess. But I am king. In those clothes, who would believe you? They just think you were crazy and we, we, we'd be worse off than before. Is one of noble birth to be put in irons because he seemeth a peasant? Ah, it is unjust. There's no justice in your land except for nobles. Trial by jury hasn't been invented yet. Aye. Then are we doomed. Where is thy great magic now, Sir Boss? If Merlin were here, he would save me. Look, Arthur, never mind about Merlin. We've got to put our faith in Sandy. We've been wandering around for three weeks, but we're actually not more than two days' ride from home. She can get to Camelot and bring help in four days. But, Sir Boss, are we not to be hanged in three? King, thou hast me. Right behind the eight ball. Came the dawn, and we were hauled out to the field where the gallows were ready and waiting. Public hangings were another source of amusement to these gentle folk, and there was quite a multitude turned out to see the fun. Arthur gave them an extra show by planting himself in front of the grandstand and proclaiming, Know ye that I am Arthur, King of the Britons, and that upon ye one and all shall the awful penalties of treason fall. And so much as one hair of my sacred head be touched with harm. The oldest majesty is serene and sacred regidness. <laughs> Tremble and fall upon the earth. Tis the king of the slaves who speaks, and his word is law. <laughs> Do you not believe me? <laughs> I am Arthur. Arthur, thy king! Arthur of the table round! Bring him forth up to the scaffold! Come, my son. Take my crown. Half my kingdom. I have a crown for thee. And a necklace of rope, too, Violet. Kneel, my son. Ego vos absolvo et omnibus peccatus. ready. No! One. No, wait! Two. Wait, you must wait! You can't hang him! It was awful. The worst moment in my life. I... I, I wonder, sir, if you'd excuse me. Certainly. Are you quite sure you're all right? Well, I, I am a little upset. I... I'd like to step out and have a smoke before I tell you the rest. I understand. Take your time. I'll be here when you get back. End.
end of Act Two. Time, the present once more. Place, the Ford Theater. Before our third act begins, I'd like to tell you a little more about our plans for the weeks ahead. If you care to join us these coming Sunday afternoons, you will hear radio dramatizations of famous motion pictures. Next week, for example, we've scheduled Preston Sturgis's remarkable comedy, The Great McGinty. You will hear famous Broadway plays, such as On Borrowed Time, popular mysteries like A Coffin for Demetrius, the musical hit Carmen Jones, new radio plays commissioned and written especially for the Ford Theater. In short, excellent entertainment in great variety. Now, a Connecticut Yankee, Act Three. <clears throat> I watched the young man from Connecticut closely when he returned. He seemed calmer now as he took his place beside me on the museum bench, ready to resume his story. Well, as I said, the sight of that hangman's noose slipping over King Arthur's head sent me into action. As I sprang forward, I heard in the distance a faint but ever-swelling and most welcome sound. I couldn't believe my ears. I looked up. Sure enough, cutting through the skies at top speed was squadron upon squadron of airplanes in perfect formation. They swept overhead, releasing as they passed hundreds and hundreds of small white specks which came tumbling toward Earth, blossoming as they fell into full-blown parachutes. And dangling from each and every parachute was a knight in full armor. What a sight. The first to land was Sir Launcelot. The moment he hit solid ground, he leapt to Arthur's side and bellowed at the crowd. Down upon thy knees, every rascal of you, and salute your king, who fails, falls by the sword. My liege, how fare ye? A moment more, and I had fared merrily into another world. Ah, good Launcelot, our utmost gratitude is thine for this deed. Faith, tis not upon me thy thanks should fall, but upon Clarence. It was he who wrought it all. Unto thee, then, gallant Clarence, are we much beholden. Think nothing of it. I've had the boys practicing this maneuver for quite a spell now. Figured it might come in handy sometime. So when Sandy showed up with her story, well, that was H hour. Good thing, too, wasn't it? That's putting it mild. Is Sandy all right? That I am, my lord. I brought her down pickaback. <laughs> Verily, tis the happiest of reunions. I have learned through many lessons that thou, Sir Boss, and thou, gentle Sandy, art my friends most dear and near. Thou hast taught me how my people suffer and what they must be given that they may attain to the brave new world of which I would be king. It would please me that thou, too, were never to part from me nor yet from one another. How seemeth it were I to betroth thee one to the other? Well, I never expected a king to do my proposing for me, but uh, I'll take you up if Sandy's willing. How sayest thou, fair Sandy? Tis even as I wished it might be, Sir King. Aye, then tis settled. And thou, Sir Boss, wilt lead us upon a quest of goodly works and noble deeds that will outshine all past adventures of the table round. <laughs> So Sandy and I were married. Don't, don't get the idea that the king put anything over on me. I had the same idea myself, but he beat me to it. Well, if ever there was a happy man on earth, I was that man. I had a wonderful wife, I had the full confidence of the king, and I was fast distributing the blessings of freedom and progress among the people. Release thou the prisoner from this dungeon. That I will not. He hath languished here these 13 years, and here he will re remain. Of what crime is he accused? Tis forgotten. Mattereth not. I have here an order for his release. Tis from the newly fashioned court, and hath a wondrous sound. And uh, what may that be? A writ of habeas corpus. Strike! Thou oh, liest name of an umpire! It was a ball if ever I did see one. Beware! Launcelot stealeth home! Slide, Launcelot! Slide! Thou art out! Never wert thou blind, Sir Umpire! Didst thou not see? Cease thy mutterings ere I send thee to the showers. Play ye ball! <laughs> Hast ever seen the like? Five rooms and modern bath and Camelot Heights. 
Sir Boss himself will bought a house in this exclusive place. Aye, aye, but uh, it is expensive. What sayest thou? Hath not King Arthur decreed that all may own their homes? Think no longer as a serf, but as one who earneth wages. And where else wilt thou find so fair a house? Tis but a block from schools and buses. Three whole years passed like a single day. And at the end of the third year, Sandy and Clarence were in my office going over the annual reports. You'll be interested in this financial statement of the Camelot Consolidated Gas and Electric Company, dear. They made a profit this year. Good. Uh, here's the survey from the public school board. Notice there's now at least one elementary and one high school in every town. You'll also find the blueprints for the new university included. All right, Clarence. Uh, I've made up a report on the Camelot Daily Post-Gazette. We've got a circulation now of over half a million. Good work, Sandy. Now, uh, about the expedition you want to send out to discover this place you call uh, uh, America? Hmm. I don't think the Navy's quite ready yet. Are these all the reports? Yes, except the one on the stock market from Sir Launcelot. I must say that he's abusing his position as president of the stock exchange. Last week he cornered the steel market and people simply don't have a thing to wear. And the week before he almost started a panic. Clarence, you've got to understand that Launcelot is a born adventurer. We won't let him go looking for dragons, so he corners steel markets. If it gets too bad, we'll pass a law. Is that all? Yep. Will you excuse me, then? It's Geronimo's feeding time. Oh, Geronimo. Is that any name to saddle a kid with? Can I help it if you taught Sandy to make parachute jumps? <laughs> <laughs> shall, uh, shall we take in a movie this evening, darling? Oh, I'm sorry, but I have a meeting of the Camelot Ladies Welfare and Cultural Society. I'm vice president, you know. Will you mind Geronimo? What about the nurse? She'll be at the Welfare Society, too. She's president. Yes. Uh, sir Boss, do you really think it was a good idea to emancipate the women? They're getting awfully hard to handle these days. Work made the years go faster, and there was plenty of work to be done. Streetcars and washing machines went hand in hand with better working conditions and a higher standard of living. Libraries and day nurseries were open before bowling alleys and baseball fields. What had taken 150 years in America, I was accomplishing in 15. Of course, there were those who didn't like the way things were going. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of opportunity. I tell thee, Merlin, Sir Boss hath not only destroyed the flower of chivalry, but hath corrupted the people with his magic. Fear not, good Mordred. I have a magic older than his. This enchantment he hath cast, cast upon the land will not endure. Mark me. We shall wait our time and strike and yet be masters of the realm. <laughs> Merlin was always doing his best to stir up trouble among the knights, but we were making real progress despite them. At the beginning of the 16th year, Arthur came around and told me it was high time I had a vacation. Didn't know but what I agreed with him. So I packed Sandy and Geronimo off to a spot where I'd invested pretty heavily in resort property, and we had ourselves a time. The French Riviera isn't what it used to be. Then it was wonderful, and I had the best time of my life. Until one day when Sandy came tearing down to the beach. Come on up to the house. Clarence is on the radio phone. No phone calls for me, Sandy. I'm on vacation. But you've got to come. This is serious. Okay, okay. Stop dragging me. What happened? Merlin. What? He got you out of the way and then moved in. Merlin got me out of the way? Yes. He talked Arthur into getting you to take this vacation. Why didn't Clarence get in touch with me? Because the first thing they did was to take over all communications. He's risking his life to sneak through this call. But didn't the king and Sir Launcelot do anything? They... Talk to Clarence. He'll tell you about it. All right. Hello, Clarence. Spill it. Listen, boss. The day after you left, Merlin and Mordred up and told the king all the gossip about Launcelot and Guinevere. Oh, no. The boys chose up sides, and there was a terrible battle between Launcelot's army and Arthur's army, which saved Merlin the trouble of wasting his own men. Divide and conquer. And I thought that was a 20th century invention. Where is Arthur now? Dead. Killed in battle. Arthur dead? Impossible. So Mordred is king, and Merlin is running the show. They're just waiting for you to get back to ring down the final curtain. They haven't got a chance. Why, with our stores of ammunition and our thousands of trained troops... Save your breath. We have just 50 loyal men left. The rest went over to Merlin. But why? Why? Because they were scared, that's why. They were scared of Merlin without you on the spot to protect them. 
Did you really think you'd educated the superstition out of these people? I did think so, yes. Well, now you know better. So the game's up, is it? Not necessarily. You remember that big cave just north of the river? Yes. Well, I took our faithful 50 and turned it into a fortress in case you might want to make a real fight of it. In case? Of course I want to make a real fight of it. I'm coming back to England. As someone is going to say someday, I have not yet begun to fight. <laughs> The moment I got back, I could see that everything was wrong. The streets of Camelot were empty, dark. No people, no automobiles, no policemen, no lights, nothing. Clarence met me in a jeep just before dawn and whisked me over to our fortifications. He picked the ideal spot for our last ditch stand. The cave was located about halfway up a hill so that we couldn't be attacked from the rear or the flanks. The enemy would have to make a head-on attack, and we were well prepared for that. I think we've covered every possibility, Sir Boss. I figure the first thing they'll do is charge across that field in formation. So I've planted a little garden to greet them. Anti-personnel mines? Right. That field out there is loaded with them. Did you test them, Clarence? Well, a committee of knights snooping around was kind enough to test one for us. And did the committee make a report? <laughs> I'll say they did. You could have heard it for a mile. Then, um, well, you, you can see the fences for yourself. Are they electrical? Natch! Now, up there on the hill, right over the cave, I've set up 20 nests of machine guns. And just in case, I've dammed up the river so that the whole field can be flooded in an emergency. Clarence, you're a military genius. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, we're all set. And none too soon. Look out there. Get a load of that, will you? How many do you figure there are? Hard to tell from here. Looks like a tidal wave coming up, doesn't it? <laughs> I see they've gone back to horses. It's quite a sight, isn't it, Clarence? Yes. Makes me sick. You give people a chance to be free, to live without fear, to find security and peace. The first chance they get, they vote themselves right back into slavery. It isn't their fault. Probably takes longer than we thought to teach a whole population what freedom really means. Teach. Brother, they have to be willing to learn. Look. Look, you can see them plainly now. And hear them, too. Must be 30,000 of them. Look at them come. Well, they'll reach the minefield in a few minutes. Won't be long now. Closer. 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 Minefield, do your duty! Dropping like insects. Machine gun batteries! Open fire! Give it to me! Break open the was quite a victory. 30,000 men slain on the field of battle in 20 minutes. But through victory came our defeat by three lines of rotting corpses all around our cave. It was impossible to get out. The disease I dreaded began to take its toll among my handful of boys. One by one, they were struck down. Finally, I got it myself. So, boss, isn't there anything I can do for you? Yes. Listen, Clarence. Listen carefully. Yes, sir. Pull the switch. The, the master switch? That's right. So, boss, things aren't that bad. We're licked, Clarence. We've conquered in one way and we've been conquered in another. Pull that switch. All those beautiful factories and mills and workshops. All to be blown to bits. We knew it might have to be done someday, Clarence. Isn't that why we loaded them with dynamite and ran the wires here? Huh. I didn't think we'd ever really use it. Thanks for the faith in me, Clarence. I'm afraid I've let you down. Don't talk nonsense. Clarence, get started. I don't want to miss the last act. I'll be right back, boss. Sit tight. Now, 
That must have been the munitions dump. All gone. All gone. The dream of... What? Is that you, Clara? <laughs> now is thy power lost to thee, thou who wert, sir boss. Merlin. Now have I conquered thee at last. Oh, oh, go away, Merlin. Scat. Sleep, sir boss. Sleep, sir boss. Sleep. Thou shalt sleep for fourteen hundred years, and then thou shalt awake in a strange and terrible land. <laughs> That's the last sound I heard back there. I woke up in my own yard in Hartford with that army guy tossing water in my face and laughing like a fool. And that's all there is to it. Well, sir, you've been kind to listen to me. I've got to get back to the place I call home now, back to Hartford. Bye. It's been nice talking to you. Goodbye, young man. He walked slowly over to Sir Sagramore's armor, ran his hand ever so gently over the breastplate with the bullet hole in it, turned, stalked down the aisle between the helmets, swords, hauberks, spears, and morions, and disappeared through the door. That was the last I saw of him, the man who might or might not have been a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Twain on his star. We hope we've followed you in spirit, if not always in letter, and we beg leave to add a 20th century moral to your 19th century tale, namely, freedom, which is greater than gadgets, must be learned and guarded still. The placards outside the Ford Theater read, next week, the great McGinty a notably hilarious comedy based on the movie classic by Preston Sturgis. Come one, come all. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court was adapted by Lillian Shane, edited by Howard Teichman, with continuity by George Faulkner. The musical score was written and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the entire production was under the direction of George Zachary. The Yankee was played by Mason Adams, King Arthur by Carl Swenson, Sandy by Charita Bauer, and Clarence by Eon Martin. The other players were Santos Ortega, Horace Braham, Neil Fitzgerald, Reese Taylor, and John Moore. This is Howard Lindsay saying good afternoon for the management of the Ford Theater and extending a cordial invitation to meet the great McGinty here next Sunday. Ford Theater is presented by the Ford Motor Company, makers of Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln cars, and Ford trucks, tractors, and buses. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Hey, thank you for listening to Good Old Radio and the Ford Theater. Please take the time to subscribe like our videos, and share them with the whole wide world. We'd appreciate it. Talk to you later. Bye now.